Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for joining me. And we're joined by a special guest today uh, from the Rustin Leader, who covers Louisiana Tech, Matt Bellinson. Matt, thanks so much for the time as we begin our uh, preview for SMU's opponents for the 2023 season. The Mustangs kick off on September 2nd against uh, Louisiana Tech. But Matt, this is a program that SMU is going to face that has already kicked off their season by the time SMU faces them in week one. Yeah, no, yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, Louisiana Tech, they're in the they're in the week zero uh, time slot this year. Um, they open their season um, at home against FIU, um, and they're going to kick things off, you know, at home uh, under the lights, 8 p.m. on CBS Sports Network. Um, you know, that was something, in talking to head coach Sonny Cumbie, that was something that was pretty clear from talking to this coaching staff. They want they want the spotlight on Louisiana Tech. It's pretty crazy to think, you know, a team that went three and nine last season, uh, you know, a lot of teams would probably say, hey, let's just kind of fly under the radar. Let's try and get things back on track and then let's have people, you know, kind of catch us by surprise. Uh, that's not how Sonny Cumbie rolls. Uh, he wants people to know that Louisiana Tech um, is here to improve. You know, they brought in a ton of transfers, you know, some from the Power Five, you know, some from some really good uh, group of five programs. And uh, they want to kick things off the right way this year, like you mentioned. Yeah, week zero. And then, yeah, they. They had the hit on the road to SMU uh, in week two. And uh, yeah, it's it's definitely not as strong of a non-conference schedule, you know, compared to last year when, you know, Louisiana Tech was facing off, you know, at Missouri, at Clemson, out at South Alabama. Um, but there's definitely some teams on here, like like you mentioned, SMU, um, you know, North Texas now and, and Nebraska, you know, kind of make up, you know, this non-conference schedule. You, know, you can give you an opportunity to kind of see where you're at before you kick off uh, in this brand new conference USA. And uh for Sonny Cumbie, I got a chance to see him uh, last week at LSU Elite Camp. Uh, he was down there doing some scouting with him and some of his staff, and a lot of them were just great guys. What's kind of the vibe around the program now that Sonny Cumbie has been there for a whole year, and, and what's kind of his style in leading this program? Yeah, I would definitely say the vibe, like I mentioned before, you know, you go three and nine last year, definitely not how you want to start off your tenure um, at one of the you know more storied programs you know in the group of five. Um, but I would definitely say the vibe, you know, at least in the spring, um, you know, obviously given the week zero time slot, they're going to be kicking off, you know, I guess, quote unquote, fall camp here um, earlier than others. Um, but I would definitely say the vibe is they're ready to move on. You know, again, I think in today's college football, you know, it's not exclusive to Louisiana Tech, but Louisiana Tech really took advantage of the transfer portal this offseason. They brought in a ton of new faces, um, even some new coaches as well um, on the defensive side of the ball. But, you know, obviously a new new quarterback you know, new wide receivers, pretty much a whole new defensive line, new linebackers, pretty much a new secondary. Um, so I think if you're Sonny Cumbie and this coaching staff, they've really embraced the fact that, yes, last year happened. It was a disappointment. There were so many factors that led into that injuries, um, you know, inconsistent play just across the board. Uh, but I think they're ready to move on. That's not to say that they're not taking lessons from last year and, you know, trying to apply that and kind of grow from that. Uh, but they're certainly viewing the 2023 season as a you know clean slate, we're going to bring in some veterans who have played at the highest level um, and, you know, hopefully get this thing back on track. That's how that's how they're viewing this season. And the the biggest transfer of all is Hank Bachmeyer, uh, who comes to Louisiana Tech from Boise State. How big of an addition is this for this offense? You know, Sonny Cumbie you know, has been, been around some pretty good offenses, um, but it seemed like just kind of reviewing the last season, um, you know, they, they didn't get what they wanted necessarily out of the quarterback position, and this year might be a little different. Yeah, no no doubt. I think, again, when you look at Hank's just resume, you know, coming from the Mountain West and Boise State, I mean, just a storied program, you know, again, in the group of five. Um, and, you know, he obviously, you know, had a lot of offers, you know, entering the transfer portal this past offseason, um, including some teams, you know, in Conference USA. And Sonny Cumbie told us a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, he didn't mention it by name, but I think, you know, deductive reasoning would tell you that, uh, you know, Hank Bachmeyer was close to going to Western Kentucky. You know, if Austin Reed had not come back for another season, um, again, he was also flirting with the Power Five and a lot of different, you know, potential NIL packages and, you know, what have you. Um, you know, Sonny Cumbie pretty much said, you know, if, if Austin Reed had decided to leave Western Kentucky, there was a strong chance that that Hank was going to head there. Um, and But now if you're Sonny Cumbie, you get, you get a true quarterback that it, it can run this air raid system. Again, like you mentioned, you know, last year you go from Parker McNeil as your, you know, uh, you know, primary starter, but Matthew Downey starts the season opener at Missouri and then throws, you know, three interceptions. And then Parker McNeil comes in, you know, throws, you know, decently, but, you know, he has an inconsistent play. Um, and then you obviously bring in, you know, a, a, red, a true freshman in Landry Liddy, 
Um, you know, again, you know, kind of spotty, you know, can't really expect a whole lot from a young kid like that. Um, and there was just never anyone that truly took rain, you know, took control of that offense. And again, if you're going to run this air raid system that requires precision, it requires timing. It's not really, it's not going to work if you keep shuffling in the quarterback, you know, every single week. Um, so I think it, the, the coaching staff made it a priority to go get Hank in this off season, you know, again, a four-year starter, um, you know, played in 29 games, you know, over 6,000 yards passing. Um, I mean, on paper, this is definitely the quarterback that you want. And I think, you know, again, you know, they're not going to admit that Conference USA is weaker, but it is a fact that, you know, with UTSA, you know, of a whole other, you know, UAB, a lot of perennial, you know, conference mainstays, you know, leaving for the American. Louisiana Tech, for as crazy as it sounds, if Hank can truly perform at the level like he's expected to on paper, Louisiana Tech has a chance to kind of vault itself back up into the, you know, I don't want to say immediately contend for the league, um, but they can definitely vault themselves back into the top, you know, three or four teams in this conference um, if Hank can truly master this air raid, which you know was a big storyline in the spring. And I think if you're Sonny Cumbie and this coaching staff, it, you know, obviously defensively you weren't great, but it all comes back to quarterback play. And I think if you know if you're Louisiana Tech, you have to like it, at least on paper of what Hank can bring you. Yeah, that the getting the quarterback solidified is something that SMU has been able to have. It also helps to have. Uh, productive receivers, running backs around him. And that's what Hank's going to have around him. Marquise Crosby coming back, Smoke Smoke Harris, uh, Cyrus Allen. It just seems like with those pieces, as well as the offensive line kind of coming back, that expectations are most certainly elevated for this offense in a big way. What has to change kind of schematically or just production-wise for them to get on that track? Yeah, I would definitely say if you talk to Sonny Cumbie in the spring, one thing that they're still, I think, you know, kind of harping on is, like you mentioned, Cyrus Allen is coming back and Smoke Harris, you know, two returners. But um, overall, they need playmakers. You know, I think in today's college football, it's one thing to say, you know, oh, he's a go, you know, he's a go up and get it, you know, type of receiver. You know, here's a nice third down target for us. Um, but especially in today's college football, and especially if you're going to run the air raid, you can't have an offense that's not going to have dynamic weapons. You know, again, you mentioned Cyrus Allen. Um, he's going to be a sophomore this year, but you know, look at his season last year. You know, he was second in the country in yards per reception at over 22 yards, you know, per reception. You know, he finished with 500 yards and four touchdowns. You know, not exactly gaudy numbers, but again, for a true freshman, I mean, he led all Conference USA, you know, among true freshmen in receiving touchdowns. Um, and then, again, you mentioned Smoke Harris. I mean, a dangerous, you know, uh, dangerous receiver in the slot, you know, who, again, really good after the catch. And I think if you're Sonny Cumbie, that has to be the mainstay of what Hank Bachmeyer's, you know, production comes from. It's getting, it's force feeding those guys the ball. You know, I think last year there was a lot, I don't want to say of compromise, but there was definitely points last year where you looked at the playmakers at Louisiana Tech and you're wondering, okay, you know, you had Trey Harris, who, you know, unfortunately for Louisiana Tech, he transferred out and, you know, is, in, is that old miss now. But, you know, you look at him, you know, Griffin Bear, who's, you know, currently, you know, trying his, trying his shot at the NFL. Um, there were games where, you know, why aren't these guys getting, you know, five to 10 targets, you know, per quarter? Um, it would just be it would just be amazing to see there would be stretches where it would feel like they weren't even involved in the offense. Now, certainly defenses can take away your best options, uh, but there were times last year where it felt like Parker McNeil and Matthew Downing, they had no options. And again, you mentioned Marquise Crosby in the run game. You know, he definitely picked it up as the you know season went along, but there were definitely stretches in that non-conference where I mean they would end games, you know, with fewer than a hundred rushing yards. And it was just given the quarterback inconsistency and the fact that you had no run game to support. Um, again, there were just no true playmakers on a down in down out basis. Um, and again, outside of, you know, Trey Harris and Griffin a of course, but yeah, I think when you mentioned smoke, you know, and Cyrus Allen, you know, obviously again, on paper, another name that they brought in from the transfer portal, you know, Decoldis Crawford from Nebraska, again, he has not had a chance to play, you know, he suffered a knee injury in fall camp, you know, last year um, and Nebraska and, you know, sat out the entire season, um, you know, comes back to Louisiana. He's a native of Shreveport you know, about an hour from here. Um, and again, on paper that, you know, that's a playmaker that you feel like, you know, if he gets healthy, you can plug into this offense um, and give, you know, Hank Bachmeyer another option. But again, he, he didn't go, you know, in the spring, it sounds like he's gearing up for the fall. You know, we'll see, you know, I don't anticipate that he's going to be ready week one, uh, but again, things can change. Um, and if you can get, you know, the production that you hope out of him, Cyrus, you know, and smoke, like you mentioned, I feel like this offense explosiveness, I feel like can really take a step forward. I mean, North Te North um, North Louisiana right now is pumping out some talent. So through the transfer portal, we could see Louisiana Tech kind of take advantage of that. 
uh, for sure with guys like Decoldus. They've also, you know, minded as well from the high school ranks. When it comes to the defensive side of things, this is a unit that loses some upfront, you know, size. How have they gone about trying to replace some of that up front um, in the trenches? And, and what does that mean for this rush defense that, you know, kind of struggled at times as well? Yeah, kind of struggle might be uh, putting it lightly there. Uh, I'm just going to read some stats here for people that maybe don't have an idea of just, you know, if frankly, I mean, they've admitted it themselves. They were just flat out bad on defense last year. I'm just going to read some stats here. Um, they had the fourth fewest sacks in the entire country last year, um, I guess 128th nationally. Um, and five and a half of their 16 sacks came from defensive backs, um, which is just it's just mind boggling. You know, there's a safety. Jaden Cole led the team with three and a half sacks. Um, so that kind of tells you uh, where things were at. And then again, like you mentioned, defensive line wise, I mean, 130th in run defense. I mean, they gave up gave up about 243 yards per game. 128th in scoring defense, 126 in total defense, you know, third fewest tackle for losses. Um, there are just so many issues in terms of just getting people on the ground last year. And like you mentioned, it starts up front in the trenches. Uh, if you ask Sonny Cumbie, that's where their recruiting lifeblood has tried to, you know, start. Um, again, obviously, you know, this is your, I guess, entering year two for him. So he hasn't had a full, you know, recruiting class truly come in yet. Obviously, this will be his first test. Um, and that's where I feel like the transfer portal has, again, helped Louisiana Tech. Um, again, like you mentioned, they've lost some names up front. Um, you know, Kivi Rose, he transfers out. Um, but again, I think, you know, frankly, if, I think if you had to inject him with true serum, you know, you look at the production that that unit had last year. You know, I think, you know, Louisiana Tech isn't exactly, you know, missing a whole lot of those guys just in terms of the production that they put on the field last year. Um, in terms of the people that they're bringing in, again, yeah, they brought in 16 defensive transfers in total. Um, you know, new linebackers coach and Cortez Carter, new defensive line coach. Um, they want a wholesale change up front. And again, you know, that starts obviously in the transfer portal. They brought in, you know, a kid from Iowa State who, again, you know, I think is going to be an interesting piece for them. Uh, you know, brought in some guys, you know, kind of from, you know, the the D2 ranks and some FCS ranks, you know, guys from got some guys from Stephen F. Austin as well coming in. So, um, again, I think defensively it's kind of similar to offense. I think you're just looking for guys to kind of step up into that void because, uh, again, it was just so abysmal last year that I think at this point um, you're just hoping that these transfers can kind of just reset everything, you know, the new coaching staff. You know, again, you know, Scott Power is still in charge of the defense as a whole, um, but I think in general, I think the transfers have to be able to affect the quarterback because they were just on the field for so long last year. And then, again, you go over to the offensive side of the ball, given the injuries, you know, they would go three and out, you know, quite a bit. And then, okay, well, let's bring that defense back out here that's already gassed that has proven that it can't stop the run, it can't tackle. And, you know, you got what you got last year. So I think defensively, as much as we want to talk about Hank, you know, coming in um, and, you know, being a change agent for this team, which I certainly think he can be, the defense, I mean, the, the, the defense has to improve. Otherwise, you know, you could be looking at another, you know, disaster year. Um, I don't anticipate it's going to be that bad. But, again, you're hoping that these transfers can give you some level of, you know, defensive line production. Well, I, I said kind of because SMU, you know, covering SMU couldn't throw uh, any stones from the glass house, stopping the run and, and making tackles last year defensively. So both teams are in the same boat. Uh, SMU safety, former SMU safety, Roger Robertson is among those transfers coming in to shore up the secondary as well. But they do have Cecile Singleton back. This is a program that has produced some quality defensive backs over the years. Meek Robertson, SMU fans know him well. Legeria Sneed, Xavier Woods. What's what's next beyond Cecile Singleton? And and just to ask, has Roger Robertson shown uh, anything since he's been on campus just yet? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll hit that first point, like you mentioned, Louisiana Tech. You know, I, I don't want to call it DBU, you know, by any means, but certainly you know, over the last couple of years, they certainly have produced a, a number of pro talent. Um, you know, even this past you know draft cycle, I know he wasn't drafted, but you know, look at a guy like Miles Brooks. You know, again, comes in, you know, after transferring from Stephen F. Austin. Um, and I mean, he just takes that secondary by storm. You know, again, doesn't have, you know, certain, he didn't have certainly the flashy, you know, interception numbers. Um, it was just a really steady force back there, you know, at, at corner. Um, and again, he didn't get drafted in this in this last draft cycle. But, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, they signed him as an undrafted free agent. Uh, you know, from from what I've heard, it sounds like he has a real, you know, shot of actually making, you know, the 53-man roster and having an impact. You know, again, I don't know how much he's going to play. Uh, but again, there's, there's another name to kind of check off um, in, ter in terms of, you know, guys that are coming into this program and leaving, you know, with an opportunity to go pro. Um, like you mentioned before, yes, um, he is making an impact. 
um, in terms of Broderick, um, you know, Sonny Cumby, they, like, they have this thing called the Bulldog Blitz, um, where they have coaches, you know, go out in the community and talk to fans and, and the media as well. Um, and we asked him, you know, in terms of now that spring is wrapped up and you and the coaching staff has an op- you know, have had an opportunity to kind of evaluate this roster, um, who, do, who does he feel like are going to be that those playmakers, like I mentioned? Um, he was one of the first names, first names that you hear um, on the defensive side, at least. And I think if you're Sonny Cumbie, you have to recognize that if you're going to get this defensive line pressure going, you know, what's that going to create? It's going to create rush throws. It's going to create quicker decisions. And, you know, hopefully it's going to create more turnovers. You know, again, you look at this, you know, team last year for as, for as bad as they were at stopping the run and up front, you know, they, they were in the top 50 in the country last year and, you know, it forced turnovers, you know, this defense. And so I think if you're Sonny Cumbie, you know, you can, you know, whether it be in the, you know, recruiting cycle or in the transfer portal, you can tell guys, like, if you come here, Again, we're not we're not the Alabamas, we're not LSU's where we're pumping out five or six guys a year. But if you come here and stay here, you're going to be developed and you're going to have an opportunity, you know, again, you might make a pro roster, you might go undrafted, but you're going to have an opportunity, you know, to make it to the pro ranks. And so I think like you mentioned Cecil Singleton, you know, forced a lot of fumbles last year, you know, got his hands on, you know, a few balls, you know, was just really good in the secondary. Um, I think if you're this coaching staff, this defensive line, if you can create the pressure that you're hoping for, Guys like Ce- Cecil, guys like Broderick, um, you know they're gonna they're gonna just gonna have I think you know a, a much better season. And I think if you're I think if this you're this coaching staff, I think you'll take it for sure. Uh, kind of wrapping up here, last couple questions. Uh, what what are your expectations for this team? I, I know we haven't both of us haven't gone through fall camps for our, our respective programs we're covering, but uh, you have a good grip on it. You've been out there in spring ball. What's kind of the expectation now for for Louisiana Tech this year? Yeah, I would definitely say they're trying to compete. Again, I don't think this coaching staff, for as optimistic as they are, I don't think they're expecting to go into this year and immediately contend for the Conference USA title. That being said, like I mentioned before, you lose UTSA, you, know, you lose UAB, you lose North Texas, um, and then you you look at the teams that are remaining. You know, Western Kentucky, Liberty. You know, I think those are kind of you know consensus. I think in terms of on paper, I think those are going to be the teams that might rise to the top of this league immediately. But again, if you're Louisiana Tech, I know a three and nine record would say, okay, we're really far away. But there were so many games last year where I think if they just had a competent quarterback and, a, and an actual defense that could create, you know, any sort of havoc, I think this group is in some games. Again, I don't know, you know, if they're competing for the Conference USA title. I certainly think they had, they had an opportunity to go to a bowl game if things bounce their way. Um, and so I think in terms of expectations, I certainly think this group is going to get back on track. I think they're, they're going to contend for a bowl game. Um, and you know, if things bounce their way and if Hank can really master this offense and take things by storm, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world if they're in the mix for the Conference USA title. I'm not going to go out and predict that. But I think if on paper, if Cyrus Allen, you know, Smoke Harris, this offense can click, you know, they're returning a lot of offensive line returners. If this defense can kind of turn things around, get some sort of production – it's not that far away. You know, you're, you, you're already better than FIU in your league. I think you're better than UTEP. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity, you know, Jacksonville state coming into this league, you know, New Mexico state, you know, they're not exactly football power. I mean, certainly Jacksonville state, uh, you know, and, and Sam Houston state, you know, certainly coming uh, from their respective conferences had some sort of success, but I, I think Louisiana tech has shown that it has the bones of a program that it doesn't stay down for long. You know, this is a group in a program that I think it was 19, you know, the, the late 1990s was the last time that this group, uh, this program, I should say, you know, had, you know, consecutive seasons of three or fewer wins. You know, that that bodes well, I think, if you're this program in terms of, OK, we can turn this around. We're, we've shown that we're a program that has staying power and that we, if we you know, get the right pieces in here, we're more than capable of turning this thing around. So I think they're going to contend for a bowl game next year. Um, again, like I mentioned, I'm not going to go out and say that they're going to, you know, win or compete for the conference USA title, but if Hank can put the things together that this offense requires, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if they're in the mix, you know, in October or late November. Uh, and quarterback play, I mean, is just so critical. SMU fans saw that when Shane Bouchelle came in and, and turned things around truly. And then, uh, Tanner Mordecai, of course, picked up the ball and ran with it. They're hoping that Preston Stone's going to be able to do that. His first game is the starting quarterback full time for SMU will be against Louisiana Tech. Do you have a prediction to share? An early prediction? The spread right now sitting at 16 and a half in favor of the Mustangs. Yeah. Um 
Wow, I didn't. Is that, is that really the spread? I had no idea. I, I just Googled it because I, I wasn't sure, but I, I thought it had opened at 14, but it actually opened at 15 and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I certainly, again, yeah, in terms of predictions, um, you know, I think on paper, again, like you mentioned, SMU, you know, historically a pretty dynamic offense can definitely get things rolling. Um, and, you know, again, we just got done talking about this defense. Um, and obviously, again, they opened the season at, you know, with FIU. Um, but man, that, you know, that's quite a, that's quite a test. And obviously losing Tanner Mordecai hurts, but uh, you know, this is a program in SMU that I feel like is going to really challenge, you know, Louisiana Tech um, out of the gates here. Like, OK, you think your defense is improved? Like, yeah, let's find out. Uh, man, in terms of predictions, you know, I would say on paper, I feel like SMU definitely has the edge um, just in terms of, I think, proven, you know, production, proven talent. Um, again, I think if Hank, you know, can master the system pretty quickly, you know, I think Louisiana Tech can compete. Um, but I would definitely say on paper how, how things sit right now. I feel like Louisiana Tech opens the season um, with a win versus FIU at home. And then I think uh, they go on the road at SMU uh, and lose their first game of the year. That's, that's how probably I see it right now. Okay. Well, Matt, we can't thank you enough for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been fun. We're looking forward to catching up with you in Dallas and a little bit closer uh, to the game as well. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate uh, Matt's time on the On the Pony Express podcast. Uh, you can always follow us wherever you catch uh, your podcast at, so be sure to do that um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. But we're not done with this edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I kind of want to weigh in with how I see the season opener going for SMU, um, and I'm with Matt. I have the Mustangs coming out victorious in that one. Being able to really, I think, start off the se season with a statement would be critical from this team to show what they're about. And Louisiana Tech is historically a tough program, like Matt alluded to. This three-win season that they put together in 2022, the first season under Sonny Cumbie, is not something that Louisiana Tech has seen much of throughout uh, their recent history. They've always really seemed to go to a bowl game. Obviously, SMU has dealt with them. Uh, in bowl games as well. I feel like the the big thing that we go back to, and it's part of the whole season, but comes down to this. Can Preston Stone start out red hot and get to, um, you know, the level that we saw at times from him right away? And um, will he take care of the football and do all those things? Because this is a Louisiana Tech secondary that is um, a solid group of five secondary um, even with the loss la uh, off last year's team that Matt talked about, the un unsigned, uh, the undrafted free agent went to the Cowboys. Names escaping me right now, but this group has size. They usually have length and the ability to run, and so SMU's receivers are going to have to get open. Um, the good thing for SMU is this game is looking like one where, when you look at the upgraded line in the trenches for SMU, and you look at what they've done from a recruiting perspective, um, both in the transfer portal and the high school ranks on the offensive line and now in the defensive line, especially when it comes to SMU's offensive line versus Louisiana Tech's defensive line, I think that's where the game is won, truthfully. SMU should have a very clear advantage when it comes to being able to push around the Bulldogs in the trenches as they'll have Jalen Knighton, LJ Johnson, that running back core, along with Preston Stone and the wider series SMU has, this has the potential for SMU to really ground and pound uh, this program, quite frankly, and be able to put together some really nice uh, drives, explosive plays. If you can establish the run, I think that gives Preston Stone a ton of time to make plays. But watch SMU's offensive line. Now, Louisiana Tech does return, I think, three or four starters on the offensive line. And SMU's new look defensive line will have to establish itself as well as they get into their first game in system, uh, in Scott Simon's system with run fits, with, uh, you know, pass rushing, all those things that are going to have to come together quickly uh, for SMU as this defense is truly revamped. I mean, when you look at it, it's, uh, it's I, just off the top of my head, probably seven new starters um, uh, as far as, you know, the two linebackers. Um, you have uh, you have Jonathan McGill. Um, you have two new corners. Uh, you have 
potentially three uh, new starters on uh, the defensive line, I would say, with Jordan Miller, Elijah Roberts, and maybe uh, Cam Robertson or somebody like that uh, kind of puts things together. Um, but you'll get to, you'll have Devere Levelston back, um, and then you have uh, a guy like Brandon Crosley back, and then um, you know maybe Brian Massey holds on to his spot, things like that. But this SMU defense is going to have to be ready to go because Hank Bach- Bachmeyer was one of the top quarterback transfers in the country. Um, there's no doubt about it. I think if SMU was in uh, need of a quarterback, they probably would have kicked the tires on him just from what he was able to do at Boise State. He seems like a guy that could have come in and, and helped your program. Um, obviously, he sat out most of last season as he awaited uh, his transfer, and uh, now he'll be coming in uh, to Ford Stadium looking to upset uh, the Mustangs. 16.5-point spread uh, for SMU. SMU um, will have to come out ready to go. This is going to be a motivated Louisiana Tech team. Uh, they ended uh, their uh, season in a tough loss, but a uh, 37-27 loss. Um, to UAB. They lost six of their final seven games, so they've got a bad taste in their mouth. SMU will have to be ready to go when it comes to Louisiana Tech. So, um, you know, that that is kind of it. We're going to dive in, obviously, much deeper into Louisiana Tech in fall camp as we're towards the end of fall camp, really, as SMU will um, be preparing for Louisiana Tech in the back half of camp uh, and getting ready for that first game, 11 a.m., kickoff uh, September 2nd inside Ford Stadium for the Mustangs. Uh, Hope you guys enjoyed uh, this edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. Um, I went out to um, uh, SMU football practice this morning, so we're going to have some notes. um, And I say football practice, football workouts. Uh, So we're going to have some notes on the site. So be sure to subscribe to OnThePonyExpress.com. I'll be able to share even more with you guys on our members-only podcast as well next week. So I'm looking forward to doing all of that. Um, Please keep subscribing to our YouTube channel and also check out OnThePonyExpress.com for all the latest. It's a busy recruiting weekend ahead for SMU. um, And we're going to preview all of that as well, or recap all of that as well when uh, things wrap up. So appreciate you guys listening. Hope you guys enjoyed this early look at Louisiana Tech SMU season opener on September 2nd. It'll be here before we know it. I can't wait. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast.